Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void and darkness was upon a face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Vayome Elohim Yehi Or. Vayehi Or. That's the Hebrew of Genesis 1 1. I thought the opening of Genesis would be an appropriate way to start this podcast. A blinding light is our topic, and it's prompted in part by the lights of Christmas, the candles of Hanukkah, and just a few weeks ago, the brightness of Diwali. Yesterday morning, I was cycling with a friend who's a nuclear physicist, and we were blinded by the light when we turned the corner. He told me it reminded him about the blinding light caused by nuclear fusion. Isaac Newton was fascinated by light, like many scientists before and since, but he went further than most to find out and feel how it works. Here's Scott Mandelbrot quoting from one of Newton's notebooks in the Naked Scientist show, Chasing Rainbows. I took a bodkin and put it betwixt my eye and the bone as near to the backside of my eye as I could, and pressing my eye with the end of it, there appeared several white, dark and coloured circles, which circles were plainest when I continued to rub my eye with the point of the bodkin. Ouch. Don't try that at home. Newton went on to stare directly at the sun until he went blind. Temporarily, at least. A blinding light, indeed. With me to discuss a blinding light in a less graphic way, I hope, are Christopher Wadibia, a junior research fellow at Pembroke College, Oxford, and the art historian and friend of Naked Reflections, Dr. Ilaria Benocchi, who is lecturer in Renaissance and Early Modern Art at the University of Manchester. Ilaria, I hope you didn't go as far as Newton in your researches for this podcast, but I imagine you've thought a lot about how artists have used pigment to represent light over the centuries. It's a pleasure to join you again. And thankfully, no, my job is quite safe just with books. But of course, light is a, a central theme in art history and a central concern of artists because light is not just what reveals something to the eye, so a centre in any of the visual arts, but also it's a metaphor itself. Light is sometimes a subject of art. So uh, you talk about pigments, and yes, indeed, one of the earliest ways from antiquity onwards to uh, represent light has been with gold. The gold is, a, is, of course, a precious material, sometimes with gold foils, for instance, in halos or in gold backgrounds in medieval altarpieces or with the mosaic gold tiles in the Byzantine tradition, for instance, in Hagia Sophia. So the shimmering light made viewers feel like the dome of Hagia Sophia was suspended. We have descriptions from the time. And, of course, light is associated with gold because it is a precious element in our life is something that we constantly have in mind, is something that in religious terms is associated with God, with Christ, with the revelation. And so there's generally always a positive association um, between light and precious materials and gold. But of course, light in the Gothic period is transformed once again. We have Abbot Suget as Saint-Denis, the inventor of the Gothic and the beautiful stained glass windows, and even wrote poems about light coming in and bringing in the revelation of Christ. So light is instrumental in creating space and in filling it up. Then we have light as a central theme in Leonardo's studies. It is central to his study of atmosphere, is central to his scientific approach. You've cited Newton, but Leonardo, of course, was quite ahead of his time at the latter part of the 15th century. And a central theme of the Baroque. So Caravaggio's calling of St. Matthew famously has a very interesting play of light along the lines of Christ and St. Peter's hand calling St. Matthew. So light is always a natural phenomenon, but also a metaphor. It's both the medium of everything we see and uh, one of the main motifs of art. 
That was a wonderful vista, Ilaria. I wonder if we could go back earlier, Chris, and look at biblical times or New Testament times and the concept of the eye, for example, as the lamp of the body or blinding light. I mean, tell us a little bit about that. And, and I wonder whether any of that actually links into what Ilaria has been telling us. I would say when it comes to how this concept of light features in the New Testament, I think chiefly it's quite prominent. And generally speaking, you know, light is associated with God's presence. Um, it's also there's this kind of juxtaposition in which light is viewed as good and darkness is generally viewed as bad. More specifically, it's, light is related to confidence and security. You know, John 8, 12, for example, which says when Jesus talked about, I'm the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so I think within this scripture, you know, we see this concept of light as being this force uh, epitomized through the figure of Christ that challenges darkness. Darkness perhaps related to concepts such as sin, such as suffering, such as, you know, satanic or demonic intrusions. I think one of the most prominent stories that I can think of, particularly as this podcast is called uh, Blinding Light, is in Acts 22, whenever Saul is struck by a blinding light from heaven, this process leads to him being converted to the way of Christ. And he goes from being someone who tracks down and kills Christians to someone who, from a Christian perspective, is used as this central figure in promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way, as it was often referred to then. And so, yeah, I think those are some interesting and relevant points to begin with. Let's just tease out one or two of those, Chris, because there's the light of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. And then there's the blinding light of this, uh, what's called the conversion of Saul or Paul of, of Tarsus. And of course, in the very word revelation, it's about revealing, it's about seeing, and the sense of what we're looking at as well as what we're experiencing. And so just unpack that a little bit for us, if you would. Absolutely. Well, I think one of the interesting bits that stands out to me from the get-go here is there's almost this dichotomy of light in its cosmological context, the kind of macro scale, and light in the more material, earthly, practical context. And so when I think of, you know, the concept of Jesus as the, the, the light of the world, it's this notion that the world has been corrupted by darkness, by sin, and Jesus comes into this world, essentially it's the cosmological, the spiritual interfacing with the material to promote very much this vision of reconciling humankind to God. And so this is kind of what I would see as the macro level notion of Jesus as the light of the world. But on a more kind of perhaps micro perspective, this notion of the blinding light, you know, a blinding light oftentimes blinds, you know, naturally people or perhaps, you know, animals. And so it's more of a individualistic notion of light. There's this concept of they balance each other, this parallelism as Christ is reconciling the world at a larger cosmological macro level. At the same time, this manifests at the individual level, at the level of communities, at the level of people being redeemed to a right standing position where they can be in fellowship and communion with the divine. Ilaria, I wonder whether in the artistic representations that you analyze in the early modern period in Renaissance, is darkness always negative? I mean, Chris talked about, you know, light representing revelation, if you like, salvation and darkness sin. Is that always the case? Well, it is a very good question. By and large, it is. However, in terms of pictorial skill, you have to think that being able to paint a nocturnal scene, which is something that starts to happen, particularly in the 16th century, in the 17th century, is a proof of immense, it's very difficult and is a proof of immense skill. And there is, of course, a poetry of the moonlight, a poetry of the night. And so nighttime and night scenes can be perceived, particularly in the Northern European tradition, for instance, in the Dutch tradition, as beautiful essays of artistic skill. But in general, yes, the play of light and dark tends to be uh, depicted along with a traditional allegorical reading of light as something positive that is contrasted with the dark, so the so-called chiaroscuro. And I was thinking as you were, were talking about the conversion of, of Saul, about the other scenes like the blinding of Samson. And there is a very beautiful depiction by Rembrandt where 
everything is about the light itself. Everything is about this sort of cone of light that absorbs uh, Samson. And again, the idea of blindness and the idea of darkness is literally manifested, visually manifested through the contrast between the areas of shadows and areas of light. Light is being enlightened, is understanding, is profound communion with God. I'm thinking about Bernini, Saint Teresa. Light and vision are very, very important in the writings of the mystics, the Spanish mystics, of Jacob Berme, but also Saint Teresa and Saint John of the Cross. And so all the tradition, the Baroque tradition that draws from it, uses light as a way to exemplify finally reaching that level of understanding and of inner communion. But As many writers say, and of course this is evident in the paintings and in the art of the period, there cannot be light without darkness. And this is very important. The two things always go together. And so the idea that darkness is always negative, darkness is necessary for for the light to exist. And even the very words enlightenment, Ilaria. Absolutely. I mean, we see, for instance, in neoclassical art, in the wideness of the marble, not just ideas related to antiquity, but an attempt to rationalize and comprehend the world. And this has to do with, as we know, with a feeling that we can, that human beings can understand, rationalize and comprehend the world. And so this brightness of neoclassical art, this clarity, another term that has a sort of a dual meaning, is typical of the art post-enlightenment. And it's not by mistake that afterwards with romanticism, the theme of darkness, the theme of the inner feelings, the inner emotion, and the sort of sometimes a morbid, sometimes a more curious attention towards the sort of grey areas of the soul and of the landscape around us become more pronounced. Of course, our conversation is less about insights and revelation and shedding light and about the blinding light there's something quite different in that isn't there and I just wonder Chris you touched on the Damascene conversion of Saul or Paul of Tarsus it was a blinding moment tell us a little bit about blinding moments if you like in some of the research that you've done as well in the Pentecostal tradition I would say one thing that immediately stands out to me is there's a distinction that should be made between light and blinding light. You know, I would say light, particularly when you look at it from a a biblical perspective, light enables human activity. A lot of verses in the Psalms and the Gospels that mention the word light, they often relate it to letting your light shine before others that may see your great deeds and praise God, or thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. And so it's this notion of light is propelling human persons on their individual journeys in this life, so to speak. But when these verses say light, in this context in particular, it's not a blinding light. It's a light that inspires, enables, enthuses, and propels. But when it comes to a blinding light, I think blinding light biblically and theologically in the the Christian tradition is often associated with repentance. It's associated with this notion of reflection and repenting from activities that that God would perceive as sinful or unrighteous, and willingly subjectivating or reforming your conductivity as a human to be on the path of righteousness within the sight of God, if that makes sense. Um, And in the Pentecostal tradition, it's very interesting how this concept of light perhaps informs notions of social behavior and and elements of that nature. So Pentecostalism, of course, it's the world's fastest growing Christian denomination. And in the sub-Saharan African context in particular, it's a mightily influential Christian denomination. But one element that I find quite interesting is this notion of these these Pentecostal churches, particularly in a post-colonial context, or in Nigeria, for example, where a lot of my research tends to focus on, these Pentecostal churches such as the Redeemed Christian Church of God and Winner's Chapel and Mountain of Fire and Miracles. There's quite a a number of them. But they oftentimes see themselves as pushing up against challenging these forces of darkness, whether it be state corruption, whether it be poverty. And they very much, particularly these Pentecostal churches, articulate this notion of the spiritual underpinning the material. And so the spiritual reality, there's often this concept of spiritual warfare. And so I think generally speaking, a lot of Pentecostal churches, 
globally, but also especially in the, in the sub-Saharan African context, see themselves as lights shining in such a way as to evangelize unchristian populations and correctively reform ineffective and corrupt governmental structures that are within their um, immediate ecosystems. Ilaria, one question before we take a breath, which is the blinding light aspect in art. You've talked about the clarity of light and light in comparison with darkness, but tell us a little bit about the blinding light in artistic representation. This is a very interesting concept because, of course, the visual arts, art is about seeing, is about being able to grasp every detail of what you're seeing. The idea of being blinded by something, it's a phenomenon that is rarely reproduced, can be reproduced maybe in contemporary art sometimes. We have an entire sector of art that is called light art that plays with art that is literally made of light. But of course, sometimes I was thinking about what Chris was saying, that light is uh, used to prompt, to suggest inner reflection. And if light is used to allow the path, to make the path and walking along the path possible, a blinding light is usually associated with being stopped on your tracks and being overwhelmed and so being frozen. It's, it's a very effective way to stop someone and having them freeze and having them sometimes repent, as you were saying, Chris, or change course or just stop. So when we have the idea of a blinding light in art, we have this very, very strong light. We usually have it associated with characters who stop and look. And so the viewer is interested. He cannot see what's inside that light. Maybe they can. Maybe they will have a revelation later. But all we see is that something has been overwhelming. And so light is also used to overwhelm. Not just it's painted in scenes that have to do with the viewer being overwhelmed, but it's used to overwhelm in religious or civil spaces. So certainly there are degrees of light that can be exploited to reach that sort of arresting effect. And it is done several times in art, yeah. This is Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. My guests this week are Chris Wadibia, and Ilaria Bonocchi. Our subject, a blinding light. In a way, it's comforting to know that scientists are still unsure about the properties of light. Sometimes it behaves like a wave, and sometimes like a series of tiny particles. Perhaps it's both. Here's Safa Pinoya speaking on the Naked Scientist show, Chasing Rainbows. Well, we know that light does move through air because we see light on Earth, but we also see light moving through space. And we know space is a vacuum. Sound can't travel through space because there's nothing to transfer the vibrations in space. But somehow light does. And that was the next question which really puzzled scientists. So scientists, Chris, are puzzled by light. What puzzles you about light? I'm working on a project at the moment that looks at the interface between black Christianity and racism in the British context. And one of the things that I find unique about light is sometimes I see a bit of a parallelism between like light and white and darkness and blackness. And I wonder why that is such in the sense of what follows from that is this idealization of that which is light. And historically, that has often lifted up this model of, of perhaps whiteness as something also that should be idealized. Often when one looks at a picture of Jesus Christ, it tends to be a white Jesus Christ. And I find that really interesting. When it comes to how that has evolved over time, of course, there are all sorts of historical factors, political factors, imperialistic, colonial factors. That being said, I think it's important from a theological perspective to challenge these historically held dichotomies, which liken light to white and darkness to blackness, as if there is something within blackness that is therefore morally corrupt or therefore subservient, lacking, deficient in comparison to that which is white. And so I think that's an important juxtaposition to, to challenge and to articulate more effective, accurate, and perhaps morally just notions of how light relates to darkness. It's interesting you say that, Chris, because I've also thought about Jesus often depicted as this white, very white man from the West rather than a Jewish Palestinian Arab. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, from the Middle East. And there are you saying, as a black man, how easily this is appropriated in terms of whiteness being good and, and blackness being bad. Of course, in artistic representations, Ilaria, are there many images of Jesus as a black man that you know? Not many, I have to say. And this is one of the famous paradox, the idea that to make the figure of Christ more approachable and understandable, it has been represented as perhaps the common man of Europe. Very often when we talk about art in, with a general term is Western art, and which means European art. And then, of course, the association is with a certain type of image of Christ. But there were images of dark Madonnas, for instance, that were very interesting, that were also existed also in Mexico. I think Europe was a much more varied place than depictions might suggest. It had strong communities of people coming from all over the world, people coming from the Middle East, it had strong Jewish communities. So we have a very narrow view of what Europe must have looked like at the time, but from Shakespeare's Othello to some beautiful depictions of St. Moritz as a dark black man in, for instance, I'm thinking uh, Matthias Grunewald, beautiful altarpiece with beautiful St. Moritz depicted as, as an African man, as a black man. There are some tiny windows in which we can sort of guess that Europe must have been much more diverse and so perhaps even more interesting to depict at the time than, than what we have today. We've talked about lights. We've talked about blinding lights. But what about fire? Why is it called the everlasting light? Is it another version of the same idea? There are a number of ways to approach this concept. The first that comes to mind would be in the book of Revelation and this notion that Christ would often refer to as the hellfire. Eschatologically speaking, individuals that do not gain entrance into heaven would therefore be sent to hell and they would be subject to the fires of hell. And so, you know, in that sense, fire is very much viewed as this, one could say purifying, one could say form of punishment, one could say negative force. But I think additionally, there's a scripture that I think about, a kind of characterization of, of God as, as a consuming fire. That would, of course, offer a more positive notion of fire within the deific context. I think that Fire has been a concept that features prominently within historical, theological, and religious communities. And there are a number of perhaps properties that fire would bring to the table that can be leveraged to articulate, you know, various religious or theological truths. All the tortures with fire to the saints, to the martyrs, are favorite subjects in art and beautiful depictions that focus on pain, on the idea of destruction. And fire is very frequently used uh, to torture and to kill in uh, Jacopus de Voragine's Legenda Aurea, which was one of the main sources for the lives of the saints in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the early modern period. And still today, we have anecdotes about the saints that derive from the Legenda Aurea. And so fire is something that destroys and something that when is present, particularly in religious context, like in the case of the Mulier Amicta Solis, is very powerful. Only God can control that sort of fire. And so it's usually associated with moments of punishment or moments of profound revelation because man is considered still quite powerless before fire. I think on that note, Laurie, when you articulate how fire can symbolize powerful revelation, I'm reminded of the story of Moses in the burning bush in the Old Testament. And God was speaking to Moses through that burning bush. And so fire can also you know, symbolize the presence of God himself. But it's interesting because it's almost a fire that consumes but doesn't destroy. And so there is this interesting sort of metaphor, but also a perhaps perplexing concept that is at play here in the sense of fire has the capacity to consume, but it also has the capacity to give life and give light. And very much God within this context is associated with this kind of perhaps dual notion of, of identity and capacity as well. I like very much, Chris, your definition of a fire that can consume and does not destroy, because this is precisely what happens to the saints who are tortured by fire. They can be consumed physically, but the point of fire and the point of their dying through fire, even 
for Joan of Arc is that the most deeply held beliefs cannot die. So the most powerful instrument that nature can wage at the body, at the corporeal, another material body, cannot destroy the soul. So fire is very often used to show that something can consume, as you said, but cannot destroy what's important, which is the point of many lives of the saints, life to the martyrs. And so it's very frequently depicted because it's the most scary, perhaps, thing that we can imagine. Absolutely. Did the ancient Greeks think that the eye gave out light rather than receiving it? For a long time, and from antiquity, it was believed that the eyes emitted a form of ray that captured the elements outside. But of course, once the Aristotelian theory of vision caused the theory of intermission was integrated back into at least the Western understanding, and this is thanks to some great Arabic scholars, the perspective changed. And there was this realization that light bounced off objects and reached the eyes. This seems like a very scientific and perhaps marginal shift but it's terribly important for the visual arts. This is a time very close to Aquinas Summa Theologia and the importance of Aristotelianism, at least in Western thought, and the theory of intermission and of vision is very central, is to give a new role to the senses and to our perception of the world as the first way of knowing it. To finish on a personal note, have either of you experienced a dramatic, blinding flash of realization that's changed your life? Would you like to go first or, or shall I? You go first. <laughs> it's quite dramatic in the sense of, was there a blinding light? You know, was it my cooking in the kitchen or was it something else? A blinding light that completely disoriented me or something. But I actually think from a professional perspective, when I started my PhD, I had no interest at all in being an academic. And I remember telling my supervisor and all of my academic mentors, no, I'm going to get my PhD and then do some consulting and make some money. But it was almost this ongoing process of a blinding light in the sense of I came to realize that this profession suits me well. I have a passion for it. And now I see myself very much committed to a life as a professional academic and researcher. And so it's about faith. Well, I can't follow such a beautiful answer, but I will say that, no, I've never had this strong moment of realization so far because I found that some of the most profound intuitions, maybe, or life decisions are actually in you before you realize them. So perhaps the blinding light is when they finally strike your consciousness, but they're there already and you had decided already. So it's never very much been a sort of a moment of blinding light because blinding light seems to come from outside and arrest you, but a moment of something surfacing finally and being allowed to speak. So every important decision like career decisions or about love, life, all the things that matter have always sort of bubbled up and became known to what was blind. Revealing what's already there. Thanks to my guests, Chris Wadibia and Ilaria Bonocchi. And thanks to you two for listening. We started with a rather hair-raising account of Isaac Newton's experiment with his eye, but I can assure you that no contributors were harmed in the making of this podcast. If you enjoyed it, why not look at our back catalogue of discussions? It's quite a resource. You may also want to check out other podcasts from the Wolf Institute or from our friends at The Naked Scientists. I'll be back next week with a new topic and some new guests.